Welcome to the second part of the Glickenhaus 007. Today I would like to discuss the drivetrain of the car. And first of all, we need to have a look back in time. When Glickenhaus started the hypercar project, they arranged a cooperation with Alfa Romeo. The idea was that Glickenhaus built a pretty hybrid race car that looks like an Alfa and the Italian brand would provide the engine for it. It would have been a great story with Alfa returning to Le Mans and a great new step for Glickenhaus. The engine they wanted to use was the Ferrari 154 V8 that we know from the 488. But the discussed power limitation of the hypercar series at the time was around 600 kilowatt and the V8 was too powerful for that. So they took the 3 liter V6 version of it that you can find in the Alfa Romeo Giulia and Stelvio. The V6 would have been shorter, lighter and with 840 horsepower powerful enough. But when Aston Martin joined the club, they asked for power limitation to be at 1100 horsepower so it would match the Valkyrie power output. If they would have to detune their V12 engine, they would have the disadvantage of carrying the longer and heavier block around where the others could drive with the compact V6 engine. And the regulators considered agreeing to this. But that did not work for Glickenhaus anymore, because the Alpha V6 engine wouldn't be able to reach that power reliably for 30 hours. So the whole Glickenhaus project was at risk, but they continued. The cooperation with Alpha was cancelled, they also decided not to use a hybrid system and they were looking for a new engine partner. They found a partner in Pippo Motors. They are famous for their four-cylinder turbo WRC engines that powered, for example, the Hyundai i20, the Ford Focus and the Peugeot 206. To quickly get a V8 engine, they agreed to put two four-cylinder turbo engines together to one 3.5 liter V8 biturbo engine. They can use a four-cylinder like flat crankshaft and can use most of the parts of the four-cylinder engines, but they need a new engine block. So now Glickenhaus had a solution for being competitive in a hypercar class with higher power output. But just at that moment, as Martin decided to pull out and everybody asked themselves if they still need the high power output since Aston Martin was the only one who wanted that, or if they could just go back to 500 kilowatt. And they agreed. So now Glickenhaus just found a new engine partner to cope with the new power limitation. And now they had the longer V8 engine in their car changed the car's concept, cancelled the cooperation with Alpha, and the previous Alpha engine would have been just fine. But again, they continued to develop the engine to have an earlier torque curve to get at least some advantage of running a bigger V8. That is the story of how they got their current engine, and now let's have a closer look at the drivetrain. We can see the flat crankshaft with wider crank pins to accommodate two connecting rods, one for each bank. If we look closely at the assembled engine, we can see the high pressure fuel pump is sitting on the intake camshaft. It is driven by this triangular cam and now we know that this is the intake camshaft and that is the exhaust camshaft. We note a pretty fat cam profile which is typical for race engines and means the valves will open early, quickly and stay open for longer, which works well with turbocharged engines. We can also see the firing order of the engine from this picture. It is 1, 3, 4, 2 on each bank with 90 degree bank angle between them. For the V8, that means the firing order will be 1, 5, 3, 7, 4, 8, 2, 6. So always the opposite cylinder will fire 90 degree later. This layout proves even more that these are two four cylinder engines built together to one engine and it's quite common for race engines. In terms of Glickenhaus and Pippo, it keeps the cost down because most parts are the same as the four cylinder. If we look at the machine combustion chamber, we see a four valve layout with two larger intake valves and two smaller exhaust valves. The spark plug sits in the center and because it's a direct injection engine, the fuel injector sits between the two intake valves. With this arrangement, the fuel gets injected with the inflowing air, can mix more easily and reaches the spark plug relatively early, which helps at high revs where you need combustion quickly. Also, we can see that the combustion chamber is not round. So it has squeeze areas where gas will be pushed towards the center when the piston goes up. Let's have a look at the piston now. There are deep pockets for the valves, which means a relatively high compression ratio and decent valve overlap, which hints to high revs. But these pockets also increase the surface area of the piston and it will catch more heat. Pistons are then usually cooled from below with oil and we can see two oil drillings on the side. The piston ring area is pretty small to catch less heat and to still provide enough stability, the piston skirt is relatively long. The turbo is positioned nicely so the exhaust gases can exit straight out. 
It looks like they use a hydraulically controlled wastegate and the wastegate pipe connects to the main exhaust like 2014 F1 cars. Engine and gearbox are fully stressed members and connected to the monocoque by these eight bolts. This means they don't use a subframe like the Glickenhaus 004. The gearbox is from extract and has a transversal layout which helps to make the box shorter and more compact, which then gives you more freedom for diffuser design. Engine and gearbox are connected with the casted bell housing, which also fixes the wishbones and rear dampers. This bell housing is effectively setting the wheelbase of the car. And there are some updates about the roof scoop. The latest assembly pictures show that Lickenhaus only uses the center scoop as engine air intake. Within the duct towards the air filter are three Naker ducts to cool other parts. My guess is that they are partly used for the clutch cooling I described in part one. The two additional intakes on the roof must be there to cool other devices. If we have a closer look at the background of the assembly, we can see a radiator which would work with the intake sizes very well. I guess this is an oil cooler and it could be mounted in the center. Future pictures of the assembly will tell us more here. And also in the background we can see two radiators which could be the air-to-air -air charge air coolers that I was missing in my previous video. Their size, depth and connectors confirm that. If we take a look back at the renderings, the only available air intakes in the back area would be the big intakes in front of the rear axle. These intakes could guide air towards the back in their lower part and the upper part could be there for the charge air coolers. One interesting feature of this drivetrain is redundancy. Because this is endurance racing, we find two starters either side of the bell housing and two alternators, one running with engine speed and one running with gearbox speed. A big thank you to Dlickenhaus and Pippo for providing all these detailed pictures. It's great to have so much insights into such an interesting project. How do you like the Dlickenhaus 007? Let me know in the comments below.